Welcome to Hoffman Doll Works Southern Hat Class. This is a Hoffman Doll Works production, copyright 2007. These are some views of the hat you will be working on. If you wish to try to make your own florals, these are some of the supplies that you will need. Bent nosed needle pliers, assorted cylindrical objects, nail clippers, tweezers, sobo thin bodied glue, different acrylic paints and watercolor colorants, fingernail polish if desired, great glass and glass stain if you can find them. My favorites are watercolors in the tube. These are the absolute best for tinting glues. Primo clay, only Primo will do. Gold beading wire in 34 gauge. On to making buds. Your first step is to wrap your wire around your cylindrical tube. Use small or large depending on what size bud you wish to make. After wrapping the wire around your tool, you will want to snug it tightly between your thumbnail and your forefinger. The tighter you can hold it next to the tool and the tighter you can pinch, the better loop you're going to get as you twist your tool around to secure each loop. These are some detail close-ups. While this is not a significant step when you're making buds, because strict uniformity is not necessary in this particular step, it is good practice for later floral endeavors. Depending on what you're doing, uniformity can be very important to the overall finish of the item. Especially items with a multitude of petals, the closer you can make the petals look, the better. You wish to twist the tool in a 360 degree circle counterclockwise to secure the first loop. Keep on twisting in order to make the stem off the bud. When you have made two buds and you wish to keep on going to make a main stem, grab the finished buds in your fingers and twist to make a main stem section. After you've continued the main stem for half an inch, then it will be time to grab your tool and make a new bud and bud stem. In this particular sample, the buds are being made symmetrical directly opposite of one another. This is not, however, crucial. You could also make them in an asymmetric pattern alternating sides of the main stem. The reason this is not crucial is you will be cutting off the finished buds with nail clippers and gluing the buds on one by one. If, however, you're wanting to glue on a cluster of buds, you need to make up your mind from the get-go whether they will be growing in a symmetrical pattern or an asymmetrical pattern so that all the bud sprays you're using on your costume will match. When you are making a bud spray, then you have to pay particular attention that you're starting with the same length of wire for each bud and bud stem. This will lend a uniformity to your bud spray, which will be important if you are gluing them on in clusters of two, three, four, or five. The most usual cluster of buds to glue on is a grouping of two or three. Rarely, occasionally, will I glue on a larger cluster. You can also take a leaf spray made with two to three leaves, sandwich a cluster of, be of buds on top of it, and then twist the two stems together. Then you have a dangly type floral that can be suspended from the edge of an arrangement of three leaves with two bud clusters. This can add a lot of variety to your florals on a doll's costume. It's not that bad on hats either. 
but this is something to endeavor to do when you've had a little bit more practice. Stick with this program from the get-go to finish your first hat. After you finish your first hat and you are satisfied, then is the time to play around and see just how far you can take your bud experiments. For the buds, you can use fingernail polish as shown in the sample, but also what works really well for doing the bud section is to use the thick three-dimensional fabric paints that are currently available. I like the shiny three-dimensional tulip paints. They can quickly build up a bud tip and seldom need more than two coats and frequently depending on the size of the bud if you're using the three-dimensional fabric paint you can get away with just one coat. Be sure no matter what you use to coat your buds with that you get all the way around the brass wire circle. If you get your colorant just in the center of the circle you think you're going to have this beautiful brass edged bud. What happens is when you go to shape it frequently the colorant will pull away because it's not securely anchored to the brass wire. When I'm trying to do colorant for the buds I am not planning on the end result showing any of the brass wire. I am basically looking for a glob of paint that after it has dried I can shape with a pair of pliers and even on occasions use my thumbnail to add vertical creases in the resulting bud. This is just a little spot of color to add to your doll's outfit. If you'll notice in this example how I am pulling and stretching on the brass wires. If you pull and stretch on the brass wires it makes it easier to wrap it around the tool. When you get to the very end of the brass wire stem you're still going to need at least an inch, maybe even an inch and a half segment at the base so you will have something to stick in floral foam as you're drying. I like to take my locking tweezers grab both ends of the brass wire securely and then twirl the tweezers in order to get the final ending to the stem. This is much faster than just holding with your fingers and twisting. After you get the correct length that you desire then it will be time to take your nail clippers and cut off any excess. Now you have a secure base with which to adhere your colorant and it is on to doing the color. I use the locking tweezers to hold on to my stem but first I'm going to go through and make sure that my individual bud branches are angled away from the base stem. This will make it easier to apply colorant. After I'm satisfied with the example and everything is on a horizontal plane, then I will take my locking tweezers, grab the base of the stem to hold it securely while I apply the colorant. In this sample I am using the fingernail polish. We are blessed at the moment in that fingernail polish comes in a lot more colors than I grew up with. Hopefully this is a trend that will continue. I am painting the base with green and I'm painting just the stem and the side stems. I'm being very careful not to paint the inside of the circles. Those are reserved for the bud colorant. Just take your time and with this instance because we will be cutting off the individual buds it really isn't necessary to go back and do the stem twice as very little of the actual stem will be maintained after you slice off the buds. You're basically worried more about getting good coverage on the stem part that's attached to each bud circle. It is however good practice just to paint the stem just so you can get a handle on how the fingernail polish is going to respond to going on to the brass wire. Think of it as practice for the next step. 
after you have completely coated your bud spray you will be taking your bud spray and setting it aside in floral foam to dry for at least four to five hours before applying the next coat it's simply easier to apply the bud colorant if you do not have to worry that your if you use too many pastels all together on your florals So I only do an extremely pastel arrangement if it is at the specific request of a customer. Unless the leaves themselves are a high contrast green, the florals will have a tendency to disappear one into the other and the work that you have put into it will not show. If not, I am sure that I mix my tonal qualities so that I have some very light shades, some medium shades, and some either bright intense shades or dark shades for contrast. Be sure you shake your fingernail polish well before you go on to add coloring to each circle. Unless you are using t-shirt paints, you will plan on having to do two coats in order to finish each bud. In this particular instant, you're not looking for a thin layer of color. A globby layer is most desired because you're trying to build thickness to each individual bud. So while when you do other shapes, you're trying to stretch a thin band of colorant around and through the brass wire, for this particular application, thickness is desired. So while you do want to try to avoid getting it on the bud stems, the actual paint that you're globbing onto each circle can be applied rather thickly. This is also an excellent way to use up fingernail polish that has perhaps grown a little bit old in the bottom of your jar. And while it may be too thick for certain applications, it will work wonderfully for making buds. This thick, almost congealed fingernail polish can frequently make a bud in one coating. Yes, I'm a strong believer, and you don't throw anything away. There's almost always a use somewhere down the line. And this is the reason, after 30 years of following this philosophy, I am now in the midst of depack ratting my house. After the second coat has been applied, set it horizontally into your landscape foam and let it dry at least six to seven hours before going to shape the buds. You will use your bent nose pliers to grasp each bud tip and gently press to make it an oval. Then if desired, you can use your fingernail to make indentations along the outsides of each bud. Most of the time, as you compress, wrinkles will form. If you want more wrinkles, use your fingernails. These are the finished buds. Constructing the leaves is basically a, just an exaggeration of what you did for the buds. The steps are exactly the same. You're just going to be using a larger tool. I prefer the knitting needles simply because they have a tapered point and it's easier to slide the wire off when you're done. The size of leaf you make will be determined by the size of the tool. When you're first starting off, it's easier to do small and medium sized leaves. As you get more practice, you can graduate to doing larger leaf forms. Now the leaves we're working on here are a simple pointed spear shaped leaf. When you get to the point where you're willing to do more complicated shapes, then you can consider ivy, oak, extreme shaped leaves. But for your first try, the spear shaped leaf is by far the easiest. Again, we are proceeding just as we did with the buds. We're wrapping our tool, pinching tightly, then rotating to secure each leaf form 
and make the resulting leaf stem. Use the tip of your finger to help push each loop off the tool. You will find if you stretch out the brass wire tautly, it makes it easier to wrap it around the tool for the next step. Depending on what you desire in the resulting leaf spray, you can either do your leaves asymmetric, alternating each side, or symmetric, directly opposing each other. In this instance, we will be cutting off the finished leaves so it's really immaterial as to whether you use a symmetric or asymmetric pattern in twisting. Now we will get to some detail shots of the leaf sprays. You just continue twisting and making leaves until you filled up your leaf spray. For beginners, it's easier to do a leaf spray that has no more than five leaves. After you've had some practice, you will find you can easily put as many as 15 to 20 leaves on a single spray and still not end up with a result that is unwieldy when you go to put the colorant on. For this particular sample, we are going to use fingernail polish. Fingernail polish works extremely well for leaves as long as they are small and medium in size. If you're going to make larger leaves, then you definitely want to use a colored glue. Larger leaves are subject to more stress of pulling the colorant away from the brass wire as you bend and shape them. With the smaller forms, this is not such a grave issue. As you can tell, this is a simple rhythmic exercise, and once you've had sufficient practice, you will find you can press, do brass wire almost anywhere. I've done it at football games, horse shows, really it is a very easily traveling craft. Now the colorant, however, is another matter. When you get to the point of doing the colorant, you basically need to be inside because it is subject to dust and other irritants that can get trapped in the layers as you're working on them. These are some close-up of the leaves right before they are shaped. We use the bent nose pliers to gently grasp the tip of each round shape to compress it so that the overall leaf shape is a spear. To make a fat spear, carefully hold the base of each of the leaves as you grab the tip and compress. This is a close-up. Next, you will want to paint. I use the locking tweezers to hold them as I paint them. Here we are using fingernail polish to coat each leaf. Set them aside in foam for the first coat to dry and then go and do a second coat. A second coating is usually sufficient unless your medium is very thin. Use the locking tweezers to set them aside in the foam. After they've dried, five to six hours, they're now ready to shape. Use the bent nose pliers to crease each leaf vertically. Then grab the tip and pull and twist to give form. It's this twist. While the irises are very similar to the florals already made, there is one important difference. You will make one loop, a 360 degree turn counterclockwise, then instead of making a stem, you bring the brass wire back over the tool directly adjacent. One more 360 degree twist, a third loop, and then you will continue to twist and make a stem. So basically you end up with three loops connected to each stem, and you will need two stems to complete each iris. After you've secured the three loops, keep twisting to form a stem. The stem is necessary for assembling the irises. 
These are some more details of iris making in progress. These can be made one inch scale, half inch scale. There are small irises, medium size irises, large size irises. There's a lot of variety in the different types of irises. This is the most simplistic of forms. When you get a little bit more experienced, there are tricks to make ruffled petaled irises, Japanese irises, but these are more advanced techniques and will be covered in later lessons. Just remember, as you make each iris stem, leave at least half an inch before it reconnects with the main stem and you continue to make the next iris. No, you do not have to make your irises in clusters on a main stem. If you're more comfortable making just one iris on one stem, this is perfectly acceptable. After you have formed your irises, next you will take your bent nose pliers and gently open up the three petals until they form a shamrock pattern. After you have the shamrock formed, take your bent nose pliers and grab the tip of each circle and bend. If you close one by accident, just slip the points into the closed area and open it back up. The first layer of paint can be composed of straight Sobo glue. You can also use a tinted glue. For very translucent stained glass effect, use the great glass or use the glue tinted with the watercolor tube medium. Frequently for the second coat I will use a contrasting color and dip it just on the very tips and then drag them in towards the center of each iris. This works better if the base of your iris is a lighter color and the edges are darker. You can however reverse the procedure. If you use the reverse, you are better off using acrylic paint mixed with the glue. It will give you the necessary opacity for this effect. Depending on the thickness of the glue mix you're using, a brush can be used to streak, a toothpick can be used to streak, or even the tip of a hat pin. The thicker your medium you're trying to streak, the more stiff your drag tool needs to be. It also is extremely helpful to work on just one three petal cluster at one time. If you try to do too much at once, your medium will dry before you can sufficiently drag it. Remember, any of these painting steps that you do on the top of the flower, you will have to turn it around and repeat on the bottom. Usually for irises this size, two coats are adequate. If you're doing much larger irises or large leaves, etc., sometimes a thin third coat is necessary. You basically want to make sure that you drag all the colored paint around the outside of the brass wire as well as the interior so that it will adhere well to the brass framework. You can also use a very thin wash of just acrylic medium pigmented with either watercolor tubes or acrylic paints to make a tinting shade. This tinting shade is extremely useful if you set your flowers aside to dry and found that they did not quite dry the color you had imagined. Then you can use your tinting medium to overcoat the existing flowers to change their hue. This can change a light pale pink to a deeper rose, etc. It is a good way for fixing accidental color mishaps. Next you will coat thin glue on the inside of the iris center petals and dip it in the glass microbeads. Set it aside and allow it to dry. The next step is to bend up the centers. 
Use your needle nose pliers for this and just curl them up until a bud-like formation is formed. Depending on personal preference, you can either totally close it or leave it partially open. Experiment and see which effect you like the best. This takes a little bit of practice, but it's not a big deal as long as the glue has not set up too hard. If you leave a couple of days between doing this step, sometimes your petals will fall apart as you go to bend them. You want them dry to the touch, but you don't want them so dry that they've become brittle. After you have made all your centers, it will be time to shape the bottom petals. The bottom petals are simply shaped by grabbing the tip with your needle nose pliers and bending slightly backwards, just slightly changing it from the horizontal. While oil irises, the lower petals droop quite considerably, this is not a good choice for applying florals to dolls and hats because it makes the base too concave and hard to glue on the desired object. So in this case, practicality is taking over from realism. You clip off the centers, leaving at least a quarter of an inch to a half inch stem on each center. You will need that length so you can join the center to the lower leaves. Your lower leaves formation, frequently the edges of each petal have become glued to the next. This is a natural part of the coloration process. You will need to use a double-edged razor to carefully slide between two of the petals. You only need to do this between two because you're making a slit in which to form the iris. I try to choose the two petals that are most naturally further apart and slice and make sure that the sl slit goes all the way to the center of the iris. Then I take a center for each base. After I have cut the bases off, I slide the center into the slot as snug as I can get it, and then I twist the ends together very tightly. This is the assembled iris. If you absolutely hate doing streaking, you can also add a single stripe to a solid iris. The streaking also does not necessarily have to be done on both the center and the bottom of the irises. You can get very nice effects by contrasting a solid iris section against a striped iris section. Mixing of the colors also adds a lot to your irises, like burgundy lower petals and rose centers, or light lavender centers with deep purple streaked outer petals. Remember when you finish twisting your iris together and you cut off the excess stem that you don't cut too short. If you cut too short, the likelihood of your iris falling apart is very high. You want to leave at least a quarter of an inch stem. You can also use just the iris centers as a larger bud on your floral arrangements. The three petal bottoms, if they're made on a small enough tool, can also make a nice accent flower just by adding a dab of yellow in the center and dipping it in micro glass beads. Unfortunately, when it's larger, the three petal bottom does not stand up well as a single flower. The bud part center section of the irises, however, can be made in a multitude of sizes and still be quite effective. While I like to use the smallest of the micro beads on to making Primo roses. Primo polymer clay is by far the strongest in thin sections. This does not mean that your roses will not be prone to crushing. 
you do need to be careful handling the finished roses. I prefer the squish, knead, and roll method for conditioning my Primo clay. Usually I mix two parts or three parts solid to one part translucent. This gives an overall finer finish to your rose. If you wish to make a nice set of tops for vanity items, use half loose of the translucent to the solid and you will end up with a loose site looking like rose which works great on the top of perfume bottles and the like. This massaging of the clay and kneading is a very important step. Not only does it make the clay easy to work with and allows you to make custom colors, it also conditions the clay so that the molecules line up properly. If you stunt this conditioning process, your polymer clay will not be as strong. So it's crucial that this step goes for at least five minutes. Primo clay, while not the softest and easiest of the polymers to work, is not nearly as difficult or as hard as the classic Fimo. It works a little bit better if it's warmer. So if you put some in a Ziploc bag and stick it in your pocket while you're working on the flowers, by the time you get to the clay section, it should be nicely warm and easy for you to knead together. This is the same reason you do not leave polymer clay out in a hot baking car because the hot afternoon sun will come into the car window, easily turn it to a hundred plus degrees, and this will start the curing process of your polymer clay, making it useless. Usually I like to mix my lightest colors together first, then my medium, then the darkest. If they're all in the same color family, I will not need to clean my hands between these steps. If, however, I am working on, say, something blue, and then next mixing up a pale pink, I will use hand lotion and rub it on briskly onto my hands and then wipe them thoroughly with paper towels to remove the polymer clay tint. I have tried other things to remove the polymer clay and nothing seems to work perfectly. And it does help if you work on a china plate or a china tile when you're handling the clay. You don't want to work with your clay on top of paper because the paper will leach some of the polymer characteristics out of your clay and change its consistency and finished strength. I've experimented with Ziploc bags for keeping premixed clay and wrapping the clay in aluminum foil. I've had some slight tinting problems with aluminum foil having an interaction with the polymer clay. So I suggest small plastic or Ziploc plastic bags. After you have mixed your polymer clay once thoroughly, you can work with it one day, set it aside, and the next day just have to rub it in your hands for approximately a minute just to rewarm it before working with it. When you go to make your flowers, depending on your humidity and the temperature in your environment, your clay will either be the perfect consistency and will not stick to your fingers at all when you press out the individual petals, or it will try to cling. If it tries to cling, keep a small damp sponge next to your work area and slightly dampen your fingers before pressing out each petal. The water will keep it from sticking to you. You will, however, have to lay the petals out on a plate and allow them to evaporate the moisture before you can join them together to make a rose, because the water will also keep each petal from binding to the previous one. 
if you find your clay is just way too stiff and with all the pressure you exert you cannot make it thin then try dabbing the tip of your fingers in across a lipstick the lipstick will add a little bit of extra tint which can look quite pretty but it will also soften just the tips of the clay as you press it and make it more malleable it simply depends on the weather and the batch of clay that you have as to which will be the best working procedure do not be surprised if what works one day doesn't work the next you roll the first petal gently keeping it attached to the clay press it well then roll it to make a tight center leave it attached to the base of the clay so you have a firm handle on your project the flower in question is a trifle bigger than true 1 12th miniature scale I did this simply for the fact that I was hoping that the photographs would be more visible and the steps would become more pronounced. Next, pinch off a very small petal, press it so it overlaps the center. It does not matter if your petals are too long. Just line them up, centering at the top, because you will be cutting off any excess when you finish the rows. Keep pressing petals, or use a plate of pre-made petals, either way you choose, and add one to the next, overlapping each previous petal by approximately one-third. Roses can be made all in one color, or they can be made with darker centers and lighter outer pedges. They can even be made with two to three. Allow the petals to slant outward as you're applying them so you get an open rose formation. Keep pressing petals and remember the smallest petals go towards the center and as you get to the outer, let, outer rows you can add larger petals. It is the hardest to make a good-looking, simple, single-layer rose, a small rose for detail. So when you find after you've completed one layer of circles around the center, if you really like the shape of that rose, go ahead and cut it off. You can always take a center that's not quite the way you want it and by adding more and more petals to the outside it will eventually look more the thing. It's much harder to come up with a very small rose that looks rose-like. So when you find that you've done what you've liked with the center, definitely put it aside. We're just continuing to add more petals we compress with the outside of our finger to make sure that we have good adhesion between the layers. Depending on the size rows you want, you can be doing anything from a single layer of petals around the rolled center to two layers or even three, sometimes four layers. Naturally, the more layers, the larger your rows. In real life, some roses are quite large. You can get away with this on a doll if you have a lot of smaller elements on the doll. If you have smaller elements on the doll, then it brings the larger points of interest into scale. If you lose just the larger, even though in real life it could be perfectly possible, your audience will have a tendency to think it's out of scale. A lot of small elements will balance a large one whether it be an extra large flower, a large bow on the dress, you definitely need to mix the two for the best effect. While it does take a while to make roses, with practice it does get a little bit easier. After you've finished your rose, you will want to take the tip of one finger 
and gently press on the outside petals, just the outside row to curl the edge of the petals back. This curling of the petals back will give it a more opened, realistic appearance. I usually put in a 10-hour day. In a 10-hour day, I can complete, on a good day, 50 roses. And this would be a mixture of small, medium, and large. While I used to use silk roses when I first started costuming dolls, I think my preference is for the sculptured rose. I simply think it adds a final edge of detail. Try making at least 20 before you give up on them, because it does take practice. It doesn't hurt to make your first roses larger than miniature size. They look excellent decorating brooch pins, hair ornaments, etc. When you go to glue on a cured Primo rose, I like the crazy glue gel formation. Basically this is a super glue gel. Uh, the tacky glue that I use for gluing on the rest of the florals does not seem to have proper adhesion to the Primo. And it does work better if you're gluing the Primo roses onto something that has a bit of give to it. They do not glue well directly to very flat objects. After you've formed your rose and you've pressed back your petals, it will be time to slice it off with a single-edged razor blade or a double-edged razor blade. Remember when you make your slice that you do not make it too close. If you make it too close, your roses have a tendency to fall apart. You want to make it low enough down that you're sure all the petals have made good adhesion to the base. This is the hat straw section. You just start gluing around in a circle, putting your glue on a little bit at a time. Don't try to put an area of glue larger than half an inch because it takes a bit of dexterity to push the straw into the glue. You do have practice straw, and I do think do your practice one first. The most likely problem you will have doing the straw is when you get to the top of the crown. That spiraling circle is a bit trickier than the rest of the hat. If you don't do it quite as well as you like, I included emergency feathers in your hat kit. A properly glued on feather plume can hide the worst of your mistakes on the top of the hat. To curl a feather, you simply take the spine of the feather and rub it against the dull edge of scissors. This will curl your plume quite tightly. While this hat was not meant to have feathers, the feathers are included just in case you have need of them. There are more details in the slideshow section of this program. This has been Hoffman Dollworks. I hope you enjoyed class.